tell me about how you decided to come to Johns Hopkins to the university and what your family background is. Well, actually, I had a great uncle who was a, a dean at the University of Maryland. And of course, when we started about going to college, he decided I should go to the University of Maryland. Well, obviously, I couldn't with the name I have, and I, of course, hoped that I'd get into the place. And actually, he died, unfortunately for him, but uh, there was no more controversy about where I would go. And fortunately, I had had a very good education at McDonough School. I was there five years. Actually, my education started going to a one-room school, and I attended that for seven years. One teacher for seven years taught all the seven or the different grades. And of course, we heard the same lessons over and over. Actually, I started school when I was five, and I, my brother was seven, and he was immediately promoted a couple of grades because he could read and write. And I, I probably could read, I don't know. I never remember learning to read, I just read. It never seemed any problem. And um, then I was uh, at home when I was, uh, <clears throat> I think I was about 12 and I, had, uh, I was in bed with the mumps. And uh, this cousin came by to see us and she decided that that I should, when we, well, actually, we'd moved to Catonsville, and I had one year at uh, Catonsville School, and uh, the family decided, or rather this cousin decided, it would be good for me to go to McDonough. And uh, she got all that arranged, and I was a day student. My parents lived in Catonsville, so during the school year, I used to go to, I lived nearby, and went on a bus every day. And of course, uh, it was the greatest thing I ever did because they had uh, very fine teachers and so on. Unfortunately, in my, I think about my third year, I was in a biology class and the professor <clears throat> had an alcohol lamp there and uh, it was getting low on alcohol and they picked up a quart can of, of alcohol and started to pour it into the thing, and there's a spark on the wick, so there was an explosion, and uh, very serious. I, it, I had a very serious second-degree burn in my face, and the professor, clothes caught fire, the woodwork caught fire, and, and everyone dashed for the door, and he finally, some of the people in the hall threw something over him and got his Got his got the flames out of his clothes, but he suffered serious burns. At McDonough, I loved athletics, and of course, I played football every year from 105 pound on up. When I got to Hopkins, I played football three years, so I had it. I probably played almost total games at least 60 times during my college and high school career, and uh, I got. Uh, at Hopkins, I was knocked out twice, totally, and I had a headache for two years in medical school, and that wasn't very nice. And I commuted an hour each day, which meant that I couldn't play poker or bridge or anything. I had to, <laughs> I had to go home and get my studies done. So does that mean you didn't live on campus when you were a no. student? No, at the university I lived. I commuted every day for about an hour, well, 45 minutes each way, and an automobile that cost $25. In the medical school, I had a, one that was a little better. And uh, But at the university, I had a great time. Actually, the first year I worked part-time filing cards from, from the Congressional Library and also working uh, in, the, <clears throat> the, in the department where they uh, put backs on books. So I learned how they were put together. So does that mean you were working in the library? Well, I guess it was the library. I, at any rate, I remember most of my time was spent in the corridor where I had great stacks of books. And of course, everything in those days was punch cards the beginning of of uh, M, uh, <coughs> of, um, of uh, oh lord uh, what is the name of the company that uh, 
the big company. IBM? IBM. It was all punch card. Does, did you ever know John French? Of course, I know of him, but I didn't know him well. And I think that, uh, yes, you know, my, my cousin, uh, <clears throat> Nellie Tom, who was a Hopkins, she was my father's first cousin, wrote Johns Hopkins, the only, biog only biography ever written. And I think he was very instrumental in helping her with that. And what do you remember of John French? He's one of my heroes. I had, of course, never met him. So I only know that uh, that story. And I'd heard his name many times. Well, he, he was around for a very long time. Yeah. Tell me about athletics. It's obvious that that was important to you. Well, I was a running guard, which meant that many times I had to come out in front of the ball carrier to clear the way for him. And, of course, I got my wind knocked out several times. The first time I thought I was going to die. But <laughs> on the line, you would, know, you would get your head frequently. The helmets were absolutely no good. And the uh, protective equipment wasn't very good in those days. I remember once at McDonough, someone stepped on my hand with a cleat, that, which was only a screw, and it, I had a very bad injury in my hand, but I didn't miss any games. At McDonough, at Hopkins, I, st I stood on something in the disgraceful dressing room we had, and a nail went right through my hand. I put it up against the wall, and old Dr. J.M.T. Finney was walking around the Union Memorial Hospital, and he took care of me. Well, that didn't amount to much, except give me some tetanus antitoxin. But it was a rather horrible thing to have a hand go through you. Well, I never missed any football, you know. But I played in every game for three years, usually the whole game. Were athletics a big deal on campus? Well, we thought it was, but, uh, you know, we played Penn State and uh, Lehigh and the University of Maryland. And uh, I remember playing in a muddy field at the old stadium. And, uh, of course, the Penn State game was very interesting. They played, beat us as 36 to 6, as I remember, uh, which wasn't very nice, but it was an interesting experience. Who was the coach back then? Uh, Dr. Van Orman. Uh, he, I think we had him three years, maybe longer, the entire time I played. And uh, it seemed to me I played all through every game. And of course we played defensive and offensive. And uh, we did quite well. My brother actually was two years ahead of me at Hopkins. And uh, we played on the same team. He was an end. Was lacrosse as big then as it is today, or was well, football I, the problem? Well, I think it was bigger, but you know, I couldn't go into that because I had to study. And actually, I was, <clears throat> I was a sort of ambidextrous. I could play lacrosse or baseball either right or left-handed. And when I started playing. Uh, golf when I was 65. I played two years left-handed and then I shifted to right-handed because I got the I got the right-handed clubs. I thought I would like to do that and it worked out very well. The, you know, the university was interesting. I belong, of course, you know, fraternities were big things in those days. And I joined Alpha Delta Phi my, my brother was in Beta Theta Pi, and that really upset him. And I must say that I, I was probably, in a way, I was sorry that I hadn't gone to his fraternity, but my friends and the, acad the people who were interested in arts and sciences, I think mostly joined that, whereas he was in a business uh, group. And I had no interest whatsoever in economics. I remember Dr. Wayforth, Wayforth, I think his name, was a professor in economics. And uh, one day we were, he was lecturing and he, he pronounced refrigerator as refrigerator. 
and the class couldn't stop laughing. That was one of the most memorable experiences I ever had. He didn't know what had happened. I assume his false plates were not fixed properly or something. And then I remember the time <clears throat> uh, someone invited this gentleman to the school who was a communist, and he was thrown in the duck pond by some of our students. That was a memorable thing. Another time, you know, we had a professor named Broadus Mitchell who was very liberal, and I didn't, I never took one of his classes, but one day I went in there to see what it was all about. And I remember he was talking about slavery and how horrible these slaves were treated and everything. And I got up and I said, well, I think there's another way to look at this thing. I think many of the slaves were very kindly treated. And I know in my own family, Johns Hopkins' father freed all of his slaves. And uh, that's one reason that the university is here today, because if that had gone the other way, instead of stopping going to school, and probably getting better educated, uh, he probably would have not uh, gotten interested in making as much money as he did. Actually, the reason he did that was that, as I'm sure most people know, he, was, he wanted to marry his first cousin. And uh, her parents uh, didn't approve of that, neither did the Quakers, because they, everything had to be, you know, very carefully analyzed before any member of a certain group could marry. So that's, that was a very memorable thing. And Dr. Bowman, who was then president, called me in to see me and congratulated me on that, uh, that uh, communist business. And, um, oh, tell me more about that. Well, you know, he was very conservative, very uh, liberal. And uh, he always held, had a big uh, session on the bachelor's cotillion. You know, whenever that came up, he always uh, uh, had a lecture on how horrible things were, the way some people had all the wealth and others didn't. And, you know, I never attended one but the other. My friends would usually tell me about these things. But otherwise, I found, you know, the university very pleasant and especially my fraternity. It was a literary fraternity, and we used to write essays and things and read them. And I remember, my gosh, it must have been six years ago, 60 years ago, my friend Dorsey Yearly, who was in my class, and a great athlete, told me one day, he said, he said you know, I still remember one of, those, one of those essays you gave way back there. Isn't that amazing? Dorsey was uh, shot down three times during World War II and survived. And he's still living and a very remarkable individual. He used to be with, T with, uh, Alex, with Alex Brown. Uh, otherwise, uh, I remember going to the 50th anniversary and Dr. It wasn't Bowman. Well, I, right at the moment, I don't remember his name, but he was, uh, I think he was about three presidents ago or two presidents. Uh, he was, <clears throat> he read my name off, and it was John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. I don't know how he did that. I thought it was very amusing. Well, I got up and accepted a little award, you know, 50th anniversary of the university. But it's funny, I don't... Uh, you know, I went in every day and enjoyed everything. As I remember, I got a very good grade in physical chemistry, and I thought that was one reason they accepted me into the medical school. But fortunately, I'd been a patient of Dr. Thomas Brown, who was a very well-known gastroenterologist, and actually he, I believe, uh, started the, the Department of Gastroenterology at Johns Hopkins, and he had treated me for a stomach ailment when I was about 15. And uh, that, um, in knowing him, one day he said to me, Jim, I think you would make a good doctor. And I had had a general practitioner, Dr. Nichols in Pikesville, and he gave me a book on um, anatomy. Those things helped me. And then I went to Europe on the Baltimore mail line and uh, 
the, uh, the professor, he was then professor, I think he was in charge of the School of Public Health. Uh, I met him and he encouraged me to go into medicine. And when I was a kid about 10 years old or less in Howard County, I sewed up a hole in a little chicken that had been bitten by a rat or something. And the little chicken seemed to survive. And that was my really first experience with medicine. And these are the things that probably got me interested in surgery. And it's amazing how these things, you know, led to my going to the medical school. And of course, I think <clears throat> members of my family thought it would be better for me to go out and make some money. But I stuck to my desire, you know, and I got into medical school actually on a scholarship. Let's not go to the medical school yet, though. Yeah. I want to pursue that, but let's not go there yet. I'd like to stay at the Homewood campus for a while yes. and talk about some of the faculty members who were important to you back then. I know there were some really remarkable people on campus, then Arthur Lovejoy and Ferdinand Hamburger, Hedberton Ever Evans, George Boaz. Were any of those important to you? No, they were. <laughs> I don't know why. There was one there that taught uh, logic and the scientific method who was later became, uh, I think, uh, secretary or treasurer or something of the Communist Party of Maryland. And I remember one day he brought up that they were having trials in Russia where these poor people were convicted and they all confessed to their sins. I don't know whether they killed them or not, but uh, he absolutely insisted that this was on the level. And I remember arguing that I thought that I didn't believe that, that I thought the whole thing was uh, communist propaganda and the way they behaved over there. I think his name was Blum Blumberg. And uh, he left uh, the universities, I remember. I don't know what all the details were, but I thought it was sort of stupid. And uh, Robert Austin was in my class. And was, I remember he was in that particular class, I think, as I remember. I also, John Chambers, who later became a neurosurgeon at Hopkins, was in that class. And I remember he lost one kidney to tuberculosis. They were very, very smart. Well, Bob Austin was quite brilliant. And uh, I, he was one of my very best friends in the medical school also. And he is still living and in reasonably good health. Like most of us, I think he's had several operations and been through a lot. But as you know, he was the, the developer of the pneumonia vaccine, which is given to all older people and has been honored by many societies. Uh, I'm sure I know other things, but of course, a doctor, <clears throat> Um, isn't that horrible? My next door neighbor's husband. Wilson Schaffer. Yes, yeah, Schaffer. I remember one class that he, I was taking an abnormal psychology, and he said uh, that he would like to uh, hypnotize the entire class. So we went through this, and you know, it never affected me at all. But quite a few of the other guys. Uh, <clears throat> they were all hypnotized. It was unbelievable. But it, I, I can't, it never in any way affected me. And I thought it was sort of a joke, but at any rate, that was that. He also, as I recall, uh, served from time to time as uh, one of the coaches in football. And he was quite a fine gentleman. I'm trying to remember the, main, the man who taught uh, uh, algebra and um, various high. Kelso Morrill? Yeah, he was a wonderful teacher. Could, I, could you repeat his name? And Kelso Morrill was a wonderful teacher, and I enjoyed his courses. I can't remember the gentleman that taught history, but I thought it was, I, I had uh, uh, ancient history and I think 
European history and some American history. Was that Frederick Chapin Lane? Yeah, Dr. Lane. He Tell was me about him. Well, he was an excellent teacher. I don't remember his making any great effort to get to know the students, you know. We usually had a fairly big class, and I was never one to go uh, <clears throat> troubling the professors. Uh, I had a, uh, uh, a student advisor who was very interested in atomic energy, and I remember he was working with um, they had some sort of atomic pile in back of the chemistry building. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, uh, the people that owned a, a, a pharmaceutical company on Charles Street, uh, one of them donated $20,000, which was donated to this project of trying to break the, I mean, to split the atom, of course, about that time, it was split in Chicago under, this, under a stadium there. I'm trying to remember his name. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I don't... Uh, I, I haven't been thinking of these gentlemen for many, many years, you know. But uh, the university was a great experience. And as you know, it was practically bankrupt at that time. I don't know what saved them, but they were in very bad financial condition. And I think we only had about 150 students in the class. One of them later became um, the administrator of Montgomery County. And you know, I never even, didn't even know the gentleman. But I talked to him later, and um, it turned out he just, I think he must have missed most of his classes, or he just, he was never very active. Tell me, you were there in the 1930s, which was certainly the time of the Great Depression. Was there a sense of the Great Depression on campus? Well, I, I don't know. I don't think any of them had any money. And um, none of them had automobiles. I had a car that cost me $25. And of course, I commuted, as I said, every day. But I don't think we thought of ourselves as being poor, although we really were, you know. I know my family were land poor. And uh, as I recall, we, the bank took our beautiful home uh, away. And the bank, president of the bank uh, acquired it. I don't know how he did that. But actually, it's still a lovely home in beautiful condition and owned by the president of the Racing Commission. I don't know whether he's, president. he's on the Racing Commission, and he's the CEO of MedStar, Mr. McDaniels, or McDaniel. And he had the whole family out to a lovely uh, dinner last fall. I was out there. He had asked some members of the family to come out and to give it some history on that area. And during that, uh, he said, you know, I think it'd be nice to have your whole family here for dinner. I said, why don't you get them together? So I got about 25 people, and we had a fascinating, beautiful luncheon outside on a lovely day. And everything looked so beautiful, and it looked bigger to me than it was when I was a child. It was amazing. It was a, a very old home. It was built in the late 1700s and was still in wonderful condition. And I remember the chimney had eight flues in it, and you'd go out through a trap door and get on the roof through the chimney. That's how big it was. And that was a wonderful childhood, being raised on a farm, you know, like that, and, uh, and going to that little school where one teacher taught seven grades. Tell me about the cane. Plant. Well, you know, that was uh, pretty much the year before I got there, but the, some of the, some of the um, students would, uh, once or twice a year, they would hire this, this carriage, uh, and they would parade up and down Charles Street, as I understand, and they had a little too much to drink, and they would sort of raise cane, cane in general. I guess that's called, why they called it the Cane Club. And of course, uh, 
I knew some of these gentlemen who were in the business school, and they were real, they were sort of scoundrels at times, you know, they would do all sorts of funny things. But the group I was, uh, Alpha Delta Phi, were very dignified people. And as I say, it wasn't, it was a, a really a literary thing. And I'm sure it did me a great deal of good to write these essays occasionally and then to give them. And we would have uh, prominent uh, alumni come by occasionally and talk to us. And I remember one, uh, he taught me something I'll never forget. He said, you know, when you get to be older and you go out and give a talk, there's certain things you have to do. You have to check your necktie for gravy. You have to make sure you have a hearing aid in your dental plates and uh, glasses and uh, make sure you have a pen and pencil. And of course, there are many other things that are unmentionable. And you know, I've used that on several lectures I've given and brought down the house. It's amazing, little things like that, what they will do. Uh, he later uh, was a pretty much organized uh, uh, a couple of medical schools, the Vanderbilt, for instance. And I think he had something to do with Duke. Who was this? Uh, his name was, uh, isn't that terrible? I forget his name at the moment. I'm sure it'll come to me shortly. That's fine. He later came back to Hopkins and taught there. He had taught there originally in the medical school. And so I guess he was an older generation from you. Oh, yes, he was. Did you mention being literary? Were you in the Tudor and Stewart Club? Yes, I did belong to the Tudor and Stewart Club. And that was a fascinating experience. You know, they would have very interesting people come there and talk. And they had that lovely, lovely room, which was paneled with a little room, another room. And I don't know how in the name of heaven I got into it, but I was elected. And I enjoyed it because Wardlaw Miles taught me what little literature I got. And of course, you know who he was. He'd lost a leg in World War I. And uh, I, I thought he was sort of dense at times, but I did get through that course. And uh, you know, his son was killed in World War II. He was, he was a physician who was killed on Tulagi, which was another island secondary to Guadalcanal. He was shot by a sniper, and he was treating a wounded Marine at the time. And I'm sure that broke up his family. But he was a very well-known gentleman, Wardlaw Miles. I'm not familiar with that name. Yeah. Why is he well-known? Well, I don't know. I guess partly because he had uh, he'd lost a leg, and it happened in World War I. And the students all knew him. And of course, I, knew, I remember the name because I knew his son, who was a, physi a physician from Johns Hopkins Medical School. He was a couple of years ahead of me. And how about some of the other social things? Um, how, go ahead. Well, they had dances, regularly, you know, and frankly, I wasn't uh, particularly interested in any of the social activities outside of my fraternity around that, because I lived in the valley there, and I, all my social friends uh, were mostly debutantes and things of that sort, and of course, I went to some of them and knew a lot of very lovely ladies. And I introduced several of my relatives to people who were married, you know, and had very happy lives. And I did enjoy that occasionally, getting to these parties. Of course, I went to St. Thomas Church, which is one of the oldest churches in the country, out in the valley, Green Spring Valley. Was there an awareness did you talk about being related to Johns Hopkins? I never, I never mentioned it. 
And if they knew it, I don't know. I know the university knew it. President Bowman, he had a lovely daughter that I knew, and I thought it was a very popular president and probably did a very good job. <clears throat> uh, Bolton, uh, president Ames was still was a president when I arrived there, but he retired. And you know, he uh, is the Ames uh, Air Air. Uh, there's a big outfit, air, not air tunnel, but at any rate, they put they they test out the aerodynamics of airplanes. That is named after Ames. He apparently had a great interest in aeronautics. Uh, another fascinating experience wasn't there, but I knew a gentleman that that helped uh, Lindbergh design the Spirit of St. Louis, and uh, I was uh, <clears throat> at his house one day, and he had a, a Lincoln convertible car, and he said, "You know that hat there belonged to Lindbergh. Put it on." So I put on Lindbergh's hat. That was quite an interesting experience. I've had so many lovely, wonderful experiences that I could go on forever about some of them, you know, mostly before I went to the university. The, the university within the Baltimore community, tell me about that relationship. Did, did local boys want to go to the university? Was that something a lot of people strove for? No, no, they didn't. They wanted to go to Princeton, you know. And uh, there was a sort of a social thing. McDonough was mostly the butcher and the candlestick maker, and then Gilman was insurance people and lawyers and physicians, which was quite interesting. And of course, quite a few of the students at McDonough were, were uh, scholarship students. One parent is dead, and uh, they mostly uh, came from rather poor families. But they did have, uh, you know, they were gradually getting more and more day students and boarding students uh, who were a little better off financially. And uh, they were, as I said before, it was a magnificent school. And of course, you know, they have one of the best campuses in the, in the country, I'm sure. Oh, McDonough is a beautiful place. And as you know, McDonough also left money for all of the public schools in New Orleans and the park, and he was a tremendously wealthy man. And uh, I was in New Orleans some years ago, and I stayed at the Richelieu Hotel, and I saw this big portrait there, and I, a man in a, in a boat being propelled across the Mississippi by a gentleman with a pole or something. I didn't understand it, but I said, who is that? And they said, that's John McDonough. Wasn't that amazing? Very much so. Now, again, you were there in the 1930s. 33 to 37. Was there a sense during that time of what was coming, of the war coming, and I, I know there were some some uh, marches and gatherings related to I isolationism and staying out of the war. Did you? I never heard much about it, but I was in France in 19, well, I must have been about 15. And I remember there was a big barrier on railroad tracks between, on the Rhine River. And they claimed that uh, that was there to prevent invasion of Germany. It was, my God, it was, it must have been 37. Uh, 37. It was, I think it was 37. Yeah, they invaded uh, France shortly thereafter. And uh, so I never heard much about any war before that. Uh, of course, everyone, so many people hated Roosevelt. I don't know why, I never did discover that, but... Uh, and then, of course, we had all the suicides going on in 29. I remember that. And one of them, I had a very f a lovely family that I knew. And uh, the, the father committed suicide. That was horrible. And, of course, we heard about, um, you know, every day someone was jumping out of a building, 
because they'd lost the money. That must have started in 20, maybe 30 or so. But Baltimore was really upset over that. I never heard much about the war. Of course, as you know, radio wasn't very advanced in those days. And as a child, we had a crystal set. And uh, the radios weren't much good. The tubes would burn out all the time, you know. And we'd listen to Amos and Andy and uh, Lowell Thomas and all those people. But I never heard much about the war. My family didn't, I don't know, they just never talked about it. Back on campus, one of the mysterious things about you, you didn't have your picture taken for the yearbook, the hullabaloo. Why is that? I have no idea. Probably I, I don't know, it might have been, a, I never, probably never heard about it. But I was, you know, I was there every day, and I, I rarely ever missed a class. And, of course, I remember Hullabaloo, but I have no idea why I was in there. Well, you made me work harder to find you and find out what your interests were, but I enjoyed doing that, too. Why? There was also um, several mentions in the yearbook and in other publications at that time about the honor system that was in place at Johns Hopkins. Well, that is quite true. I never saw any evidence of any cheating. And I think they really, the students really followed it. Of course, there were always some dead beach. <clears throat> you know, they didn't pay much. If, you, if, if things didn't misbehaved or you didn't do your work, they, they let you go. And I remember several good old boys that were there that only lasted a short time. So you had a sense of academic rigor oh while my. you were there? Oh, I tell you, I was. I made up my mind if I didn't get in Johns Hopkins Medical School, I, the family would be disgraced. So I really hit the books, and that's the reason I didn't take up lacrosse and uh, other things. And I love football. I wouldn't miss that for anything. And I, as I say, I played in every game for three years. And I thought I was pretty darn good. And I remember writing, oh, yeah, I know what it was. Uh, you had to write a paper in order to not take a certain course. I would have been better off, but I passed the darn thing. And I remember passing, I took an examination in French and passed it in my freshman year. I probably would have been better off if I'd taken the course, but uh, I mean, I didn't have to take it because of that. So, I, you know, I wasn't as academically inclined as I should be, frankly. But I didn't have any trouble there, you know. I took every chemistry course they had, including uh, physical chemistry, and I passed all of them with no trouble. In fact, I think I had enough courses to get a P go on for an MA or, or something, but I, I didn't do it. But my advisor, my academic advisor, advised me to take everything, so I just did it. And of course, I didn't realize until later that in order to get into the medical school, you had to have a speaking knowledge of German and French. And of course, I didn't even realize that when I was taking them. No one told me. But I, I enjoyed both of them. And I didn't have to fool with French because I picked that up in high school. And I could read it quite fluently. So there's no problem. German was really, well, I, we had a professor that was very tough, but I didn't have any problem, thank goodness. But you know, if I hadn't studied, I probably wouldn't have gotten into medical school. One of the things that is currently going on at Johns Hopkins, and it's student-inspired, which excites me, they're trying to bring back and, and also establish Johns Hopkins traditions on campus. And 
they keep turning to me and asking me questions. Well, I want to ask you, what are important Johns Hopkins traditions? You know, it's amazing. I'll have to think about that one. I know one thing they used to do, if you got injured on the football field, they would start chanting, get up quick, here comes Abercrombie. Well, Abercrombie was the doctor. And I don't know, I mean, I thought it was horrible. But they did that, and he was a very pleasant gentleman. But that went on on a, I don't know, I remember that. And of course, uh, well, as you know, lacrosse pretty much started at Johns Hopkins. And that was way back there. Tell me more. Well, that's all I know. I think some students, uh, some of the, in the early days, you know, they, and I don't know when Hopkins, it was originally, as you know, a graduate school, and they gave PhDs, which of course made it the first one in America to give PhDs. It was the first university in America, as I understand. And uh, Harvard and Yale and those places didn't amount to much. Of course, American medicine was terrible. Uh, Johns Hopkins, as you well know, was the first really decent medical school. Uh, I'm not even sure there were any medical schools. Most doctors uh, learned their medicine by uh, ten, uh, you know, paying some physician or group of physicians to lecture to them. And uh, many people in those days would start treating patients that they'd never, they, they'd never had any clinical experience until they started practice. Their information all came from going, following some doctor or going to some lectures for which they paid a certain group. And uh, I think, and John, all modern medicine, the teaching and everything is based on Johns Hopkins. And you know, when they, of course, as you know, the university was established, was, was going several years before the before the uh, hospital was built, I think probably 10 years. And uh, as you know, the first, the university was in a building there downtown. Uh, and uh, I think the first class, they only had something like 15 students. And they were afraid since the entrance examinations uh, requirements were so high that they wouldn't get any students. That's how bad it was. And I think they were surprised when something like 15 of these people had, had, who had been inquiring showed up. And of course, uh, the higher requirements were partly due to Alice Garrett. And as I'm sure you know, how she rounded up money and eventually came up with over 500,000. I think most of which she supplied. Mary Elizabeth Garrett? Well, it was, I thought it was Alice, but no, Alice is the one who had Evergreen House. Well, at any rate, she was the daughter of old John W. Garrett. And of course, he made his money because Johns Hopkins got him appointed president of the B&O. And he had a big battle with the Board of Trustees because they didn't want John W. Garrett. And of course, it was through this, they were... <clears throat> They were they were they weren't they didn't have any money actually they was a poor family and due to this of course they got a great fortune and that's probably the reason they've been so generous to Hopkins and uh, but also uh, the other three women I think were all daughters of the board of trustee members and of course they were all friends or cousins of Johns Hopkins. And that's the reason they did such a good job following out his desire and his will. And I'm sure you've got, you've been through the will. And well, tell me about that will and why you think it was so important. Well, in the first place, his, his will was written, I think, seven or eight years before he died. And he had already incorporated these, the university and the hospital. And I, th I know that he definitely wanted a medical school. He also left an endowment for a Negro orphanage. Now, you mentioned that there were several people in your class who 
went to medical school with you. Oh, yes. And what I'd like to talk about is what kind of preparation did you get on the Homewood campus that made you successful in applying to the this very prestigious medical school? I think because I took... Uh, I took interesting courses like chemistry and physics and uh, well, especially past getting an honor grade in bio and uh, physical chemistry. I think that impressed them because there was a lot of physics in that and uh, it was a very difficult course. And I, I was amazed that I did as well as I did. And of course I had the French and the German and I also knew Tom Brown, who was in the group that uh, passed on people who were interested in going there. And I think that played a part. I remember going before this group when I applied, put in my application, and he was in that group. And I said, my God, this is wonderful. And I think that probably helped. He was half blind. and. But a very, he, he treated all the senators and congressmen and people who were important. Who was Tom Brown? Thomas, Tom Brown, he was uh, the gastroenterologist. He founded the Department of Gastroenterology at Hopkins, as I understand it. And was there a group of you who, did well, you Bob, all know that you wanted to go to medical Oh yeah, school? there were at least 10 applied. Bob Austrian. And um, Bud, uh, well, he's dead, unfortunately. They were mostly Jewish boys. They came down from New York, you know. And I think, uh, I'm trying to think. I, I think maybe the only two or three of us had got in there. I never checked too carefully, but I, I knew that all of them, you know, you're like brothers in the medical school. By the time your four years is over, you know all of these guys well. And, uh, you know, I can call any of them at any time and talk to them, and it's just as if we were still over there. Frank Hinman is another very, well, he came, he wasn't a Hopkins graduate. Actually, as I remember, I don't think there are very many of us got in. Bernie Pink, I remember, got in, and Bob Austrian and myself. And I don't really believe we had any others in there. Pink died. He was a urologist. He died of brain tumor, I think, years ago. So you went down to the School of Medicine. Tell me about that time period. Well, I'll tell you, that was delightful. You know, I enjoyed the whole thing. And uh, I, anatomy I already pretty well knew, because I practically memorized, uh, you know, I knew all the muscles, nerves, veins, arteries, bone, everything. And of course, uh, the session in the anatomy building, which is still there, I think, it's probably, it's <clears throat> it was a very nice building. Uh, at any rate, uh, I remember anatomy, of course, you, you, <laughs> You usually have teams of four, and uh, <clears throat> it's done alphabetically. So, so I, I saw I had Higgins and Hopkins, and uh, who else was it? Hopkins, Higgins. Well, at any rate, unfortunately, Higgins was had to repeat the, the year, and he later became a very prominent uh, medical man in Richmond. And actually, he treated a, a, in -law, a cousin th that I had down there, so I followed his career quite closely. And then Henman was the son of uh, one of the world's leading urologists. His father has a standard textbook of urology. And Frank eventually, well, he was in the service, of course, uh, and uh, uh, he had the residency in uh, urology at Hopkins, as I remember, and uh, later became has been a professor in the, uh, the been in charge of urology in the in the University of San Francisco Medical School, and has written numerous textbooks. 
and um, including a beautiful illustrated book on urology and children. He's world renowned. Uh, Bob Austin, of course, is a, was a professor. I think some some place in New York. I think it recent, for the last few years has been in Philadelphia, and of course he's been honored by many societies. He's certainly one of the world's leading uh, uh, medical men, and of course is known as I mentioned for developing the pneumonia vaccine, which is. Absolutely, it should be given to everybody over 65. And I remember even as a student, he was very interested in pneumonia. Of course, in those days, as an intern, you had to do everything. You did a perfect history and physical, and you did the urine, and you did the blood work, and uh, you really had to toe the line. I mean, we worked sometimes almost 24 hours a day. And if you wanted to get an internship there, you really had to work because everyone wanted an internship. And I was very fortunate to get one in surgery. And Dr. Fowler, I don't know where they want me to go. I can, am I going ahead of myself? Not at all. Uh, of course, Dr. Fowler was the head surgeon when I was there. I mean, before I came. and. I got my appointment in surgery from Dr. Firor, but Dr. Blaylock arrived that year. And as an intern, I served many times as assistant to Dr. Blaylock. And I remember actually going to sleep stand, standing up a couple of times, holding retractors. Can you believe that, going to sleep standing up? But sometimes we would work all night and come in there and go to work in the morning in the, in the operating room. Nowadays, you know, that's all been changed. I think they pr practically punch a climb clock now. I mean, they, and they, they have to leave there sometimes when they don't want to because they were severely criticized for over overworking the, the house staff. But they thought <laughs> nothing of that when I was an intern. And the residents were like gods, you know. They were they were sort of... They were really qualified to be professors. And I don't see how anybody can be better trained than the residents of Johns Hopkins, as they turned out. Of course, I remember Mason and Watson and uh, Ravitch. And I heard Dr. Dandy one day, I was in the, serving as an intern on Dandy's team, and uh, I remember he threw some instrument and he told told Dr. Ravitch, you'll never be a, re a neurosurgeon. Of course, Ravitch turned out to be one of the greatest general surgeons in the country. And he wrote many interesting articles and books and so forth. But I tell you, he really had charge of those interns and people under him. He was a remarkable individual. Of course, Mason was too, and Watson. They were remarkable surgeons. And of course, Blaylock had all of these wonderful guys under him, steering him through surgery. I mean, he wasn't much of a surgeon, but he knew the research work. And um, of course, the Blue Baby uh, th operation was developed because for Dr. Tausig was interested in it. And as I understand it, she talked him into doing that surgery. <clears throat> but he learned the technique over in the doghouse with the Negro uh, technician who was, uh, had the movie, had the, I think they did a movie on his uh, work. And of course, uh, he helped us do d operations on dog surgery. I remember Bill Gross, who was a very fine general surgeon. I was, I was giving anesthesia for him. And as I recall, he got one organ mixed up with another one. And it was sort of amusing because he was a very smart guy. And I remember one day I was giving energy for him and I started coughing. And I, for no reason at all, you know. And I was on obstetrics at the time and I remember standing by the, the autoclave because I was so damn chilly. And the next morning I took myself to uh, to the to the resident that was uh, serving, uh, you know, it was on the medical uh, residency, looking after the 
interns, and uh, he immediately admitted me to the hospital. And I had pneumonia, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And uh, I, uh, you know, they sent me home rather prematurely. And I was to take a little time home, and a mother caught this horrible condition. And she was admitted to Johns Hopkins Marburg, and uh, she was in critical condition. And they thought she was going to die. And Murray Fisher came to me and he said, you know, I think if we give her a blood transfusion with your blood, she will develop immunity. So lo and behold, they did, and she rapidly recovered. And Dr. Longcope wrote a paper on this condition called virus pneumonia or virus X pneumonia. And as far as I know, that was, they accumulated several patients. And as far as I know, that was the first paper written on, on this condition. Of course, I could be wrong. And uh, of course, they had no treatment. And that was that. But I, uh, I had a call for a while, and I finally cleared it up. It was in the lingual of my left lung. It didn't get into the whole, whole of the other lung. But uh, people began to die from this condition. You have made several references to the doghouse. Let's talk about what you mean when you say the doghouse, and well, tell me about Vivian Thomas. Well, that was, uh, they had this uh, one, f one section of it was devoted to, to dogs, and he took care of the dogs, and they were used quite a few times, and there were, as soon as their wound healed, and then they would work on another organ. You know, they'd take out pieces of the coal, and they'd take, they'd take gallbladders out, they'd, take, they'd operate on the thyroid and the brain and uh, everything. And it was, it was fascinating surgery. And as soon as they got the dog healed, they'd go do another operation. And the dogs were beautifully treated. And they had wonderful food and everything. And uh, I don't know what happened to them eventually. But at any rate, Johns Hopkins is always noted for its wonderful service in the doghouse. Uh, Anatomy was in the same building as I remember, and also histology and a few other things. And uh, a lot of work was done there on infantile paralysis. And I think they uh, were beaten shortly by whoever it was that discovered, uh, you know, the treatment of infantile paralysis. Of course, that was a big thing when I was young. But none of us got it because we lived in the country, and I guess we just never came in contact with it. But uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the doctor who had charge of public health who limped around. He'd had infantile paralysis and was a very delightful gentleman. And as I think I told you, I was on in this boat and I met the doctor who was in charge over there. His name slips me at the moment. At the School of Public Health? Yeah, it'll come to me eventually, but I'm very slow sometimes on names that I haven't thought of for many years. It's very embarrassing, but I've learned it probably pays to keep records and review them occasionally on names. It does. It does. It certainly works for me. Yeah. Now, I believe... Were you part of the Pathotomy Club? Oh, yes. Tell yeah. me about, the, and mention the Pathotomy Club, please. Yeah, I, well, I joined that, too. I guess we joined the first year. I'm, I'm asking you to mention the Pathotomy Club. Oh, I yes. Mention it by name. Yeah, the Pathotomy Club. That was a great bunch. I mean, these were, well, I considered the leading students, you know. And thank God I was invited to join. And I always enjoyed it. We had lunch over there. And most of the time, they had somebody that was paid, you know. And several of the guys lived in the building. Frank Hinman, for instance. Frank was one of the few students that had an automobile. He had a lovely Buick. But at any rate, a good bit of the time, I would go to lunch there. Frankly, I was so bad off financially that I often ate very little lunch. And that there was a little uh, little place there that uh, served fast food. It was a white building, 
It was about a block from the pathology building up the street. It's still there, I think. And I would, uh, I never ate much lunch. I found out uh, quite early that, uh, that milk had uh, something in it, uh, an amino acid that made you sleepy. And a kind of, before I knew that, I was tending to go to sleep in, in Dr. Adolf Meyer's class in, in psychobiology. And uh, it was sort of boring. But Dr. Adolf Meyer used to have uh, the inter the, some of the interns and students come to his home on Sunday for lunch, or perhaps it was tea, and he would discuss our affairs, you know, and he was a very pleasant gentleman. Uh, of course, he was an extremely well-known uh, uh, psychiatrist for many, many years, and he established psychobiology which I think is pretty much returning. You know, they've gotten a per, they, the present, uh, well, he's retired now, but the man that uh, was chief of psychi psychiatry there for many years does not believe in traditional psychology, uh, psychiatry. He believes instead of uh, diagnosing people on their symptoms, you ought to diagnose them on the cause. And of course, he does not believe in putting people on couches and letting them talk. And he does not believe that, uh, that you can have suppressed memories like being sexually assaulted and so on. He thinks that is a farce, as far as I can determine. And um, he thinks that uh, psychiatry is still in the, still in the, in the, well, it's something that, you know, is totally mis- uh, treated and, and diagnosed. That's what I hear from what little I've read about it. And uh, he is still very active and has recently written a book, I understand, on the history of psychiatry. Paul McHugh. Yeah, McHugh. And I've, I've talked to him once years ago and uh, at a luncheon, and I was very impressed. And he must be a remarkable individual. But he has real ideas about, you know, he thinks a lot of this stuff on the diagnosis of psychiatry is based on, think, you know, on more on um, talking to patients rather than on actual how the body is responding. And, of course, you know, they're now discovering more about the uh, physiology of mental diseases rather than something that... Uh, something that you don't really know what caused it. And I think that uh, probably he's changing the whole situation as far as psychiatry is concerned. McHugh. Mm -hmm. You've made several references to being very poor when you were a student. Oh, yes. However, I know that in recent years, you've been able to be very generous to Johns Hopkins University. Tell me about that and why you think that's important. Well, obviously, I'm interested in research, and I think, you know, the, his, the we've got uh, good clinicians who are dime a dozen, but we don't have enough brilliant researchers. And, of course, they don't get paid much of anything during their long period of training. And I've always been very interested. I mean, I, to me, everything in the world could be changed. I mean, I have a habit of looking at something and say, this is ridiculous. This thing should have been made differently, or they should add something. And I've been interested in, I, I was extremely interested in something to automatically stop your automobile if you get too close to it. And I'm interested in changing a golf ball so you could pick it up electronically if it was lost. And, you know, there's so many things that pop into my head. I think that uh, even, uh, even eyeglasses, you should have a holder so you can clean them properly. And hearing aids, you should have a better method of putting the battery in and a better method of putting it because the people that need them, many of them don't have very good sensation in their fingers and whatnot, and they, they don't wear hearing aids when they should. 
I mean, that's been a habit of mine all my life. I never look at, I rarely look at something and I don't say this thing should be changed. But you know, as a physician, I, I never really invested money in anything. I was very serious about body armor, of course, and I, I really worked on that diligent for many years and actually first helped the, design the first body armor. And I got the Ordnance Department interested, and they produced the first body armor in 1945, which of course wasn't used until we got to Korea, where it was, uh, eventually they had 50,000 vests over there. And then they gradually progressed on and on. And, uh, you know, I've been severely criticized also, I was fairly criticized, uh, you know, for instance, I took care of battle casualties as soon as it got hit. I mean, my aid station was always on the front line with the company that was fighting. And I probably shouldn't mention it, but uh, I gave a lecture before a, uh, <coughs> uh, a uh, something had to do with a veterans' um, annual meeting in Washington recently. And I didn't know until I got home, but I looked at this little bio they had written, and they claimed that I'd had more frontline battle experience than any doctor in World War II. And I was absolutely amazed. But I believed in getting, you know, aid as soon as possible. And of course, unfortunately, we did not have uh, surgical teams on the front line. In fact, we never had them at all. In, in the Pacific, and we had no surgical team with Merrill's Marauders, but the Chinese were given surgical teams that had come into use, and they followed us. I mean, we led two Chinese divisions in, into Burma, and we never had a surgical team. And sometimes it took us as much as two weeks to get our wounded to any medical facility. And here the Chinese were with American surgical teams in back of us. And it was only when they finally, we finally joined a regiment of Chinese called the King Force that uh, I, found I could get their surgical teams and I brought that right up to the front line in, in two battles, which was amazing. We could take care of the wounded as soon as they got hit. I know you've written a wonderful book on the subject of your World War II experiences, and I think that's definitely part of the record. I think that's so important. Well, I enjoyed it, and as I probably told you, I did it because of the, of the men that fought. And that's, that's so important to get that history down from the eyewitness point of view. What I'd like to concentrate on here today is talking about relationships with Johns Hopkins. Oh, yes, of course. And so let's, let's concentrate on talking about why you feel that it's in, philanthropy is important for the university. Well, obviously, you know, Johns Hopkins apparently is one of the few universities, for instance, Harvard, apparently they invest their money so it, it grows, whereas Hopkins takes the money and uses it to improve their facilities. And uh, they obviously are doing everything humanly possible to become the leading research, medical research institution in the world. And they can't do it unless people give them money. And I, my theory is if you're successful in what you're doing, you're going to get plenty of money because no one wants to give money to some half-baked place and have it squandered. And there's no question about it, Hopkins is getting to the point where anybody can give money and know it's going to be put to good use. And of course, I gave, uh, well, I gave him <clears throat> some money some years ago because I had, you know, I'd had scholarships. And of course, I had great pride in the institution and I began to realize that uh, Johns Hopkins has given so much to the world, and it meant a great deal to me, you know, to be a great, great nephew, although I never gave it much thought until I was uh, in practice and, you know, was trained. 
And uh, so I did what, I, as far as this professorship goes, I conceived that idea about 10 years ago. And uh, oh, I think it was maybe eight or nine. And I thought it'd be very easy to get some of the rich relatives who had, um, their family fortunes were due to the fact that Johns Hopkins left them money. One, one, of, my nep one of my first cousins, John Clark, Judge John Clark, Judge John Clark died. Uh, he was worth five million dollars, most of which went to his nephew, to his one of his brothers. But he left uh, five hundred thousand dollars to Johns Hopkins Hospital. Joe was interested in giving the five hundred thousand dollars to the hospital for oncology, and uh, I said, Joe, you know. We ought to take that money and set up a professorship. So I talked to Dr. Dave, uh, David Hellman, and I said, how can we do this? So we had a meeting uh, with the <clears throat> chief of medicine who left Hopkins. And at the moment, his name slips me. He, he was <clears throat> there before the current chief of medicine very good man. Oh. I think he came from New York and he got a better job. At any rate, we went over and had a meeting, a little luncheon, and he said, well, I, he said, I'm going to talk to the hospital and see if they want to do that. They can put this money aside and if we get two million dollars, then we can have a professorship. And I wanted, I wanted to call it the Johns Hopkins Family Professorship in honor of Johns Hopkins. I think we got it up to about $800,000, something like that. But it turned out that my niece, who really had never taken any interest in Johns Hopkins, and uh, didn't pay, you know, she didn't, I don't know. Her mother died there for one thing, and she had a hell of a time trying to get any records. I mean, she called and sent things and so on, and and they just didn't seem to pay any attention to her. And uh, one day I was sitting here, and uh, I got this phone call, and she said, "Jim, are you sitting down?" And I said, "Yes." She said, "I I've, I've decided to make up the rest of the two, of the money that you've been asking." I think it was a one million two hundred. Well, she'd already given. Before that, she'd given me $250,000. Said, I'm going to give you the other million. So that's how that came about. And of course, she immediately got extremely interested in Hopkins, and she was reading the history and everything. And uh, of course, when we had the banquet, uh, she was ex got extremely interested, and she helped uh, us look up all the collateral descendants, you know, to, to ask for the banquet. And we got, I think, of course, that the day of the banquet, which was at the Peabody Library, I had a stroke, a cerebral hemorrhage, and I was in bad shape, so I couldn't go to this thing. And also I got my nephew, Sam Hopkins, he got interested, he made almost 400 phone calls to get fine relatives, you know, collateral descendants. There's something like 250. Most of them are not named Hopkins. Very few are named Hopkins. But we found them from all over the world and, and several states. And you know, we got something like 80 collateral descendants to that banquet. And we, we and she organized a picnic at, at Clifton, Johns Hopkins Summer Home. And they had something like 150 people there. And, a, and she passed cameras around, these disposable cameras, and they all took pictures. And there are many, many pictures. And uh, Liza also has gotten interested in having a biography, another biography of Johns Hopkins written. And she's working on that. And what's Liza's last name? Liza Bailey Musgrave. Her husband is uh, the world's authority on Brahms, and he's written many books, I think 10 books on Brahms. And he is a professor at the Juilliard School of Music. 
uh, he has his PhD and he's in the University of London, but he's now a U.S. citizen. She met him through a friend. Uh, so she'd been unmarried, and uh, she was the world's leading uh, woman in uh, in uh, marketing of uh, all sorts of products. She also traveled the world for many years, uh, gobbling up small companies for bigger companies. And her last job was combining Kraft with Philip Morris, which was a multi-billion dollar operation. She's absolutely brilliant and is now a trustee in the, I think, uh, in the medical department at Hopkins. And of course, she is in a tremendous position to help them because of her knowledge of this, how these things work out in the private industry. Well, I can tell that you've been not only generous yourself, but very instrumental in pulling all of this together for medicine. Tell me about, uh, and that's where you've chosen to concentrate yeah. because of your career. Tell me about why you think the School of Arts and Sciences gave you the background that you needed and why you think it's important for people to be generous to the School of Arts and Sciences. Talk to me about why it made a difference in your life. Well, I, you know, it, it made, gave me a knowledge of the world and literature and history and mathematics and chemistry and all these things. I had very little knowledge of any of them except French and German. And I was very, I was really a very inexperienced in things, being brought up in the country, and uh, and uh, I just didn't have any idea of the world and how economics worked. I still don't, but I'm interested in, in economics now. I never had to pay any attention to it. I didn't know anything about money or anything. In fact, I didn't have, really have any money until I was in my 60s. In fact, I was chronically in debt. But I began to do fairly well, you know, as a surgeon. And um, my competitors are still living. Of course, they're, I think they're all dead now. Of course, I'm very fortunate being able to survive to 91. And I'm living today because of the wonderful work that was done at Hopkins. And, uh, you know, so many, many people now, their lives are being saved every day. Coronary artery disease, you know, is unbelievable. You know, when I was a medical student, we didn't know much about the heart. We only gave, we could give digitalis, and that was about all. And medicines used to be compounded by pharmacists. And, you know, when I was a kid, the only pills we ever got were given to us by the general practitioner, a little paper cup. You didn't, you didn't go to a pharmacy to get your medicine to amount to anything. And, but I was shocked at how little we were taught about the heart at Hopkins when I was a medical student. But I was extremely impressed by these wonderful teachers, you know, and dedicated doctors, you know. In those days, doctors were really dedicated. And you, you, you didn't mind getting up in the night. I was many a night. I got up when I was in practice and took care of gunshot wounds and stab wounds, and never got paid a nickel. Doctor Hopkins, we have had a wonderful session here. Are there any things we should talk about that we haven't? Well, yeah. There's one thing. I think what Johns Hopkins, you know, they. Uh, for the first for the hundredth for the first anniversary at the university, and then at the medical school, they actually brought the genealogy up to date from Johns Hopkins' collateral descendants. I think what they ought to do is find out every descendant of Johns Hopkins' family, and and n seek all these people out and say, "Do you know that you're?" You're a descendant from Johns Hopkins' um, family, and uh, send them um, the little magazine and get them interested in Johns Hopkins. Now, it might cost them a hundred, I don't know, 
But I think there are an awful lot of people out there who are descended from Johns Hopkins' ancestor, Gerard Hopkins, who came over here in 16, I think it was 52, and he married, the family married the most influential people in the country. I mean, my God, some of the people, the families that came off before Johns Hopkins are extremely prominent. The Warfields, one of, uh, one of Gerald Hopkins' daughters married a Warfield. I think he was the first uh, governor, well, he founded Howard County. And he married uh, one of uh, Gerald Hopkins' daughters. Or maybe it was his son that married the daughter. I'm a little mixed up. But there's so many people who married prominent people, like Johns Hopkins' mother, or grandmother, was a very wealthy family. And uh, there are a lot of them like that. If they gave these people some pride in their family history, I think a lot of them would, and, and send them, say, the little medical the pamphlet that comes out, which is so fascinating. I read the whole damn thing every time I get it immediately. I think they would find an awful, a tremendous interest. And that wouldn't cost them all that much. I know you can locate practically anybody just on the computer in five minutes and with the telephone number and address and everything else. And they could take that gene. There are a lot of people in Harford County who don't even know, probably don't even know they're related. There's a woman that just came in here named Hopkins. And I talked to her on the phone the other day, and, I, and she's definitely a, a descendant of Jared Hopkins. And there are a couple of Johns Hopkins, uh, there's a family in Philadelphia named Johns Hopkins, who is some relation. And there's a Johns, a Johns Hopkins went to Harvard with my, with my nephew. And You're everywhere. I mean, all of this is on the internet. And it's pretty well brought up to date until my generation. Well, they brought it, Hopkins brought it up to date, uh, all the nephews and nieces of Johns Hopkins. Of course, you know, he's, the only descendants are from his sister, Sarah, who married a Janney, and my great-great-grandfather, whose name was Joseph. And all the rest of them, they never had any. They, the children all died or something, or they were killed, or they died of yellow fever and uh, various things, tuberculosis. Joseph Hopkins died of tuberculosis, and he left a widow. Well, no, it was uh, John's father died, but my grandfather died of tuberculosis because John's Hopkins' father died and left uh, all left these uh, children. And his wife uh, was apparently a very good manager. And the family actually got together $10,000 to to put John's Hopkins in business or help him. Uh, he left his uncle, who had been training him. Actually, he took over his uncle's business when several of the Hopkinses went to Ohio to teach the Indians how to farm. They made two trips out there, and I think they almost got killed one time. But uh, Johns Hopkins was running his uncle's business during a good bit of the War of 1812. But there's so many fascinating stories in this family, it's just unbelievable. I mean, most of them married prominent Quakers, and uh, they're just relatives all over the place, many of whom are very well off. And I don't know why. I think every university should, uh, you know, try to work on uh, the families that had anything to do with founding them. And God knows any Hopkins relative ought to be very proud of what the old man did. Because his will, you know, was very concise. And he, his trustees did exactly what they, what they wanted, except they, I don't think that they, they did right in, in moving. They should have taken Clifton Park and put the university there, which he wanted. But everyone thought they, they was a malarious area and it was too far out in the country and all that baloney. He wanted a boulevard between the two. 
Um, Nellie Tom, the one that wrote the, wrote the book, who was my father's first cousin, used to go to dinner there. And she was still living when I was um, in my 20s. And, uh, you know, she used to talk about these things. And they liked the old man. He was extremely helpful to his nephews and nieces all his life. And was very, very fond of them. And, uh, and of course, they, were, they didn't resent the fact he didn't leave more money because he left them plenty of money. He was very generous to a lot of people besides Johns Hopkins. And the Negro Orphanage, most people don't even know that. And he also was very helpful in establishing the first YMCA in America. It may have been the second. I'm not absolutely certain of that. But he did a great deal for the Negroes, including that orphan asylum. And then there was a school where they trained people for for just general things like our carpentry and so on, that he helped. And uh, he saw he was a joke. But I don't know why. I think the story was that he had all his records destroyed. I can't believe it. Apparently he did a lot in his head, you know. But he, he could write very well. He had an excellent handwriting. And my signature looks exactly like his. And I had no idea. And my left ear sticks out just like his. Isn't that amazing? But he wasn't a bad looking man when he was younger. We'll have to put your painting right up there next to his. I don't want to paint him. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. No. Hopkins, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. I've learned so much here today. Well, I could go on for another 24 hours, but I think I've done enough. Thank you so much.